Revelation chapter 4. We're going to um, try to tackle verse, verse, uh, both chapters 4 and 5 since it's one scene. Uh, actually, it's, well, it's one, uh, like, how would you put it? Uh, one vision, two scenes. Does that make sense? And so what's going on is um, uh, two scenes of a, of a vision that, that starts in chapter 4. And chapter 6 will continue that, but I, I, I'm not going to get into chapter 6 this morning. So let's remember the key verse before we have a word of prayer that really opens up the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 19, where um, John is told by Christ, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Okay, now that um, really, then the big picture of Revelation is the things which you have seen, that was the vision of chapter 1. All right, the things which are is chapters 2 and 3. We covered them with the, 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 um, the messages to the seven churches. And then the things which will take place after this is the rest of the book. And that's where we're just jumping into now. Okay, so that's where we're, we're headed. Why we know that is because of Revelation 4, verse 1, the first verse we're going to read, which says, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice was, uh, which I heard was like a trumpet speaking. Let me put it up so you can see it. A trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. That's why we know this is the futuristic part of the book. This is where it begins. So exactly what Jesus said in the outline of the book in chapter 1, verse 19 we're jumping into that third section. And so before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you as we look into the future starting this week and um, trying to understand. Uh, Lord, again, this is uh, uh, some outlines of what is, is coming, not the whole picture. We know that. But we pray that you give us understanding of your word and, um, and open our minds that we might see it and see what you have for us in these two chapters, because there's a very important conclusion that we need to come to. And so we ask for your help, Father, that your spirit would be our teacher, that you help me to be clear, um, that, that your word might be understood, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're going to break down this prophetic section from chapter 4, verse, uh, uh, chapter four to chapter 22, let me just give you again three different sections. Chapter 4 and 5 is dealing with the scene in God's throne room, and the question that really is coming out of this is, why is God going to take back the world? Because he's going to. Why is he going to do that? And you're going to see two reasons in chapter 4 and chapter 5 as to why he's going to do that. That's what we're going to focus on today. Then the great tribulation is really chapter 6 through 19. And so we're going to deal with that. It'll take some time. That's a bulk of the book. That's a seven-year period. So there's a lot of information on what we call the Great Tribulation in those chapters. It's the most extensive in all the scriptures, not even close. And then in the last uh, three chapters, 20 to 22, we see the millennium, the final judgments, the eternal state, which is answering the question, what happens after God takes the world back? What happens then? And so that's really how, why the Revelation is the capstone of the scriptures. So this is where we're at, okay, chapters 4 and 5. We're jumping in then to scene one of this vision, which is chapter four, and we've noticed, first of all, this open door. Let's go ahead and I'll read it here, chapter four, verse one. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter, which is exactly the same wording as, as the end of, of chapter 1, verse 19, when Jesus said, John, write the things you've seen, the things you've, that are, the things which now are going to be hereafter. Okay, so the, you'll notice this call to come up. And so my question to you is, come up where? Where's he going? Yeah, he's going to be caught to the throne of God, and that's, if you're thinking heaven, I'm thinking the same thing. And I think you'll see this becomes obvious as we keep going through the passage. What's the purpose of him coming up? To see the things which are to come hereafter. Right, to see the future. You got it. It's a prophetical part of the book. Okay, so we jump, we're, no, we're jumping in that. Now, um, 
I want you to also notice now the throne and his occupant, okay? So at verse 1, verse 2, we're gonna, again, we're going to just walk through these two chapters. We're going to think it through. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow about, around about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. And there's some detail there. I'm, I'm just not going to cover that. I, I, we get lost in the weeds, unfortunately. We're going to do these two chapters. So um, my question is, who do you think is seated on the throne? You think it's God? Okay, let's see if you're right. Skip down to verse 8. Chapter 4, verse 8. And the four beasts each had them six wings about him. Two were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. You're right. It's talking about God. The one seated on the throne is, in fact, God Almighty. Okay, so uh, we've seen that. Now let's also uh, talk about, there's 24 elders. Let's go to verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, or thrones. They're, by the way, it's the same word, throne, okay, uh, as was God's throne. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, these 24 elders, the question is, who are they? And I think you have to look at the description here because, again, we, we, we didn't have to go into a whole lot of detail to figure out that was God the Father sitting on the throne. But these guys, it, we're, we're going to want to know who they are or at least get a decent idea who they are. So let's look at some details. Um, what did you notice, first of all, about the 24 elders? Okay, they got crowns? Good. You notice that? We're going to deal with that. What else? They're clothed in white. Very good. And they're, and they're seated on thrones, right? Okay. Now, seated on thrones. Let's go to Matthew chapter uh, 19. And what I'm trying to show you here is that uh, Jesus told his disciples that they would be seated on thrones. So we, we, we're in the realm that it could be human beings, is my point. Okay? Chapter 19 of Matthew, look at verse 27 and 28. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now it's twelve, not twenty-four. Okay, but we get the idea that you could be a human being and seated on a throne in God's kingdom. Okay, so it's in the realm of possibility that they're human beings. Now, we also, you, you folks also point out that they're clothed with white robes. Let's go back to Revelation. Look with me at chapter 3. It's right in front of this. And two different verses. Verse 5, chapter 3. This is Jesus talking to the church at Sardis. And he says... He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So again, these are Jesus is challenging literal believers. You overcome, you'll be seated, you'll, you'll have white raiment in heaven. Okay, now notice something else. Verse 18, same chapter 3 of Revelation. He's talking to um, now the church at Laodicea. Uh, not a, uh, both of these churches are not godly churches. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. The shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So it's kind of interesting, again, that in, in the case of seated on thrones as well as white robes, it could be believing humans. Let me give you one more. They, we, you mentioned that there's crowns on their heads. The word for crown there, because there's different words for crowns in, in the Greek language. This one is Stephanos. We get the word Stephen from it. Okay? And, and um, this is a... Uh, it's interesting. The word crown there is, is used... I'll, I'll put up a note for you so you can see it. It's, it's used for people who would win an athletic contest. So often it's called the victor's crown. Uh, or it also could be used to honor somebody of, of, of dignity. Okay, it's interesting to me. I didn't know this. This was used of Christ's crown of thorns. I did not know that. 
when they platted a crown of thorns, it was used of that. Um, let me show you another spot where it's, it's used. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Again, keep your finger in Revelation. I'll, I'll be right back. But if you're fast and you want to look this up with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and you want to look at verse um, 25. Paul says, Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. That's our word Stephanus again there, the victor's crown. But we an incorruptible. We're working for something eternal, something that's not going to... to uh, uh, corrupt and, and wipe away. If you, if those of you who have thought about uh, Paul talking, and maybe some of you have, uh, to to Timothy in Second Timothy chapter four verse eight, where he's about ready to be to be executed, and he says this. He says, "Henceforth there is ra- laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous Judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing." So. It does seem to be, in, in my uh, opinion, that these, that these um, seated individuals are actually, uh, 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 they're victors, they're, they're people who have walked with God. Now, are, are, there, um, are, are there 24 of them only, or is it a representative number? I'm not sure on that. Uh, you'd have scholars that would probably look at that differently. But we do know that there's 24 that are surrounding the throne and they seem to be human beings. I think you'll see that as we, as we go on uh, from there. Let's move on. Uh, God's glory and power then go on display. And there's a number of ways you see this. We'll talk about, first of all, what you would hear, what John hears. I'm in Revelation chapter 4 again. Look at verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And that word voices, by the way, can be roarings or even um, you might have noises or sounds. Um, And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So uh, what John is hearing is thunder and what is, uh, again, what he describes as voices, could be uh, some translated rumblings or roaring or sounds. So there's, there's the majesty of God seen in what John is hearing. But there's also the majesty of God in what John is seeing. Okay, what is John seeing so far? Just in verse 5. That would, that would, could terrorize you in a way, but also impress you to God's majesty. I'm sorry? Okay, lamps of fire. What else are you seeing? Flashes of lightning. You got the seven lamps that are representing the seven spirits of God. Okay, let's go to verse 6. And before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Can you imagine that? This beautiful... Um, those of you that have gone to the Lincoln Memorial, there's a reflection pool. Have you seen it? That's impressive. This is, he describes it as a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So now he's got this sea of glass he's looking at, and he's got these four angelic creatures that are going around the throne. And so, if you're like me, you're asking yourself, well, who are they? Who are they? They seem to be like cherubim or angel type of creatures. But it's interesting what they're doing. It's clear that they have access to God's throne because they're, they're on it, they're around it. They're, 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 they're moving around, evidently. They're full of eyes. What do you think that symbolizes? Full of eyes. Yeah, knowledge, right. Knowledge, being able to see, look around. Okay. Um, they had each of them a different likeness. Let's keep reading. Verse 7, And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face like a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying uh, eagle. By the way, did that show up elsewhere? Hunter's thinking yes. You'd be correct on that. Yeah, there's a vision in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 10, and, and um, there's more to that, but that, that specific verse mentions. But, but was, what was there was one creature with four different faces on it. These are, seem to be individual creatures now. Um, I'll give you a thought on that. Lion representing the royalty. I think these are all representative of Christ's nature, by the way. The royalty, um, the calf representing his service, sacrificial animal, the man representing his humanity, 
the eagle representing his deity, they had different likenesses, okay? And they're all, notice they've also got six wings about them, very similar to the description in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, of cherubim. Or I think it was seraphim there. I think it was seraphim. Uh, a type of angelic creature. But I, I'm going to read again. Uh, verse 8, And the four beasts which uh, had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Do you think about these creatures saying this over and over and over again? Now, it's very similar again to a vision that Isaiah had in chapter 6 of his book, verses 1 to 3, where he saw a picture of God on his throne, and that is what the angels were saying. It's kind of interesting. They were not saying, um, you know, love, 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 Lord God Almighty. They were saying holy. Uh, some people... Uh, would say that the holiness of God is an essential attribute. So we've seen these four things so far about this vision in chapter 4. We've seen the open door, the throne, and its occupant, the 24 elders surrounding the throne, and this majesty and power of God on display. When you come to verse the, the second part of verse 8, we, we see the uh, worship of God on display. I'm going to read the section, and then we're going to ask some questions, okay? I have uh, several of them. Let's read uh, chapter 8 in the middle of the verse. Uh, let's see. Oh, I read the whole chapter 8. Didn't I? Verse 8. Let's go to verse 9 then. When those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, and the four and twenty elders uh, fell, uh, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So question number one, for what are the creatures worshiping God? Again, the last part of verse 8, what do you see? What are they mentioning specifically about God? His holiness is the first thing they mention. What do they mention next? By the way, if you missed Josh's class this morning on Sunday school about the attributes of God, he was dealing with some of this stuff. Okay. Uh, somebody said eternality. Okay. There's something in between those two. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Very good. His omnipotence, his all power. Okay. Which was and is and is to come. What's that saying? Eternality. I think John had that one. Okay, so those three things are just bang, right out, of the, right out of the gate. God's holy, he is omnipotent, all-powerful, he is eternal. Was, is, is to come. Question number two. How are these creatures worshiping God? Well, what are the four living creatures doing? Verse nine, what are they doing? Right, very good, Karen. They're, they're giving glory and honor and thanks to God. You got it. Verse 9, glory, honor, thanks. Do we do that? That's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be praising God. Now, how about the 24 elders? What are they doing? Yeah, they fell down before God. What is that showing? Humility, reverence. God deserves our humility. He deserves our reverence. What else are they doing? They're casting their Stephanos, their victor's crowns in front of him. What is that showing? Yeah, you did it, God. You, really, I don't deserve that crown. You gave, you, you gave me the ability. You gave me the opportunity. You gave me the life to do this. You deserve this crown. They're giving their crowns back to God. And I think that's one of the great blessings of of, uh, and remember, Paul's talking about the victor's crown is laid up, not just for him, but for all those that love his appearing. He's talking about walking with God that hopefully you'll have something to give the Lord. I think these guys are representing us in that. I got a third question for you. Uh, for what are the 24 elders worshiping God? What are they, what, what is, what's the reasons that they're giving for worshiping God? Well, let's look at verse 11 again. Thou worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, power, Okay? So they're praising God for his worthiness to receive these things. 
And what's the, set, what's the zinger here at the end of the thing? That's it. Everything exists. Or he says, or he says um, put it to you, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure, they, or your will, by your will, they are, that means they exist, and were created. The idea, everything exists because God chose to create it, including ourselves. That's what they're saying. I have a fourth question. Is God's creation, as it now stands, giving him the praise and honor he deserves? The answer is a resounding no. Remember, we're trying to answer the question, why is God taking back control of the world? And what is the answer from chapter 4 of God's heavenly throne room is that the world in its rebelliousness is not giving God the, the honor he deserves. And since God has every right then to, cre to take back the world, since he created it, he created it for his glory and honor, and, 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 and we as his creation are not giving him his glory and honor. Not only that, we're destroying each other. We're ruining the image of God that he's placed upon us, we are rebelling against our creator, and God has every right to take this world back. We're going to know that. We're going to need to know this because of what's going to happen when you get to the great tribulation. Why God would do this. Well, that brings us to chapter 5, scene number 2. Now, same vision... John's still in the throne room. By the way, chapter 6, he'll be still in the throne room, but let's keep moving. Chapter 5, he says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. You see the word book there? Many of the, many, we tra translate that scroll. That's what it is. It's a scroll. Written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Okay, now this scroll is pretty important. So let's ask some questions about it. Um, in the description of the scroll, the question really becomes, first of all, what does this scroll represent? And this is one of the times that, um, again, we have to pay, pay attention to some details here because they'll lead us, I think, in a, in a good and wise direction. All right, what did you notice about the scroll? There's some details that are there that are, are going to be important. It's sealed with seven seals. That was a common practice that they would seal... Uh, scrolls and and the question is are there seven seals kind of on the edge of it okay or is it as you unroll it you come across another seal and it seems to be the latter of the two that there's a seal you unroll it somewhat there's another seal you unroll that you break that you unroll it what else what was the other detail that you noticed about that there's another detail there yeah josh yeah, duplex. It's written on both sides. They ha you didn't know that they had good copiers back there, did you? Now, that would be important, too, <clears throat> and the description of how this thing works. Now, again, the question is, what does this scroll represent? Um, let me hold that for just a second, and let's talk about the problem with the scroll. Verse 2. He says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book, the scroll, and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. So what's going on here? Um, so we're going to try not to miss what's going on here. Have you ever been at the bus stop and you thought you missed the bus? Well, try to, try to focus in on this and not to miss what we're talking about. I'm going to give you some scriptures that we're going to look up in just a second. In ancient Israel, deeds to the land were kept on scrolls that were written on both sides of the paper, by the way. They're often kept in a house of scrolls. And so I want to take you to a couple references that might enlighten us as to what's going on here. And we're going to take them in the order I've listed them. So it, we're, going to, it's going to, we're going to move, obviously, toward the front, because Revelation is the last book of the Bible. We're going to be in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel. It's a little past the center of your Bible. Daniel chapter 12. And we're going to keep moving toward the front, the next two verses, okay, the next two passages. Daniel chapter 12. It's the, last, it's the last chapter of Daniel's prophecy. By the way, um, when I was in college, when we're studying 
prophecy. We studied Daniel and Revelation together. And it was a very excellent course because they really do go hand in hand. Um, especially the last six chapters of the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. But in Daniel chapter 12, he's given an interesting um, statement. Verse 4, But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and sealed the scroll, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Isn't that interesting? Daniel was told, seal the scroll. That's about 600 years before Christ. Now we're seeing a scroll in heaven, in this heavenly throne room. Uh, is there a connection? I, I think there is. Uh, go with me also to Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel is in front of Daniel. And you want to go to the beginning of that book. It's quite a large book. Ezekiel chapter 2. Look with me at verse 9 and 10. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Again, I'm coming back to Revelation, so if you're not fast, you can just stay there. Ezekiel writes, he says, And I looked, and behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. Isn't that interesting? And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. And you will find when this scroll starts getting unraveled in chapter 6 and following. And by the way, that will dominate from chapter 6 to chapter 19, that section dealing with the Great Tribulation. The opening of that scroll will dominate that section. And as you begin to crack the seals of the scroll, that's exactly what's coming out of it. Lamentation and mourning in woe. One more passage, Isaiah chapter 29. Why this is significant is, is Isaiah is pointing out a common problem with the opening of a scroll that, we, that is, I think, going to help us as we go back to Revelation again. It's Isaiah chapter 29, and you want to look at verse 10. A actually, um, yeah, let me find the right, at verse 11, I'm sorry. He says, in the vision of all is becoming to you as words of a book. Do you have a note there? Scroll. That is sealed. Which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Somebody who is learned, is educated, they can read. And, and they, they would understand in that culture, you have to have the permission, you have to have the, the, the ability to open this scroll. Now, in the next verse, he's, they went to somebody who, who couldn't read, and they said, well, why don't you open it? Maybe, maybe you would do it when the other guy who's, who's educated enough knows he's not, he shouldn't. And the other guy says, well, I, I can't read it if I opened it. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a done deal that they couldn't answer. But, but there, there are qualifications, what I want you to understand the qualifications for opening certain scrolls. Educated people understood that. So when the angel cries out in Revelation chapter 5, and he says, who is worthy to open the scroll, to loose the seals? And, and, and when John says, there wasn't anybody worthy, what's going on here? There's something in connection with this. One must be qualified to redeem a property before he was permitted to open the title deed. Now, that's what I have been told, and I believe that would be correct. Let me give you a couple things that go along with this. You have to be from the right family. Now, are you familiar with the situation in Ruth? And I'll just read it to you real quick. It's Ruth chapter 4. Again, we're jumping around, but we have to understand where we're going with this. So Ruth is in the early part of your Bible. You've got Joshua, Judges, you got Ruth. And Ruth chapter 4, right at the end of the book... There's a reference to, again, redeeming property, okay? And so I'm re reading from Ruth chapter 4, verse 4. It belonged to Naomi and her husband. They had, uh, they had left the property. They were, uh, Naomi, had, her husband had died. She was impoverished. She could not buy the property back. She could not redeem it back. So Boaz is going to the, the elders of the town He's willing to do this. Now, notice if you would, Ruth chapter 4, verse 4. And I thought to advertise thee, he's talking now to a, another kinsman, 
by it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if, not, if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. Isn't that interesting? He's saying there are only certain people that can redeem this property. You're first in line, I'm next. You got the first dibs on it. So what is that telling us? You have to be from the right family. And I will submit to you, the person that has the right to open this scroll is Jesus Christ himself. We'll see him in just a moment. And he had to be a human. You also have to have the ability to redeem. And so this scroll seems to be the, the deed of the earth. Ownership of the world. Right now this world is sold under sin and Satan. Satan is called the God of this world. And what they're looking for is someone who could buy the world back to God. Someone who could bring the world back under God's control. This title deed to the earth. But no one has the right to do it. Or even open the scroll. No one's good enough. No one is found worthy. Who would be qualified to buy the world back to God? You know what I'm saying? You have to be from the right family. You've got to be a human. And you have to have the ability to redeem the world. So who does that fit? Nobody of, of us. We're all sinners. And this caused John to weep much. How is the world ever going to be bought back to God? That's where we find one of these elders. Who I think is a human being who's gone on to glory. Verse 5. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, to open the scroll, and to loose the seven seals thereof. So we have this encouraging message from the elder. And the elder is saying, there is a lion of the tribe of Judah who has the ability to open the scroll. To loose the seals thereof. He also calls them the root of David. His reference is there. If you want to look them up, I, uh, for time's sake, I don't know that we have the time. Revelation In Genesis 49, verse 10, Judah, which is the tribe that Jesus comes from, was compared to a lion. And the root of David, it's interesting, in Isaiah 11, verse 1, it talks about a branch from David, a descendant of David, who would be the Messiah, have all the seven spirits of God on him. And then in chapter 10 of the same, it's verse 10 of the same chapter, it mentions being a root of, the, of Jesse, which means he's, uh, he actually was not only uh, David's son, but he was David's um, um, ancestor because Christ created everything. Amazing, it's an amazing statement. But we've got to move on. Let's notice the Savior than in the throne room. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Now, I thought we were talking about a lion. We were talking about a lion. He says, the lion has prevailed, and yet now we have this scene of the lamb. Why? Why the switch? Because this, this is a big switch. From a lamb to a lion. I, Lori, what are you thinking? Yeah, he can't, he can't redeem us as the lion. He can't just come and destroy evil because we get wiped out with it. He's got to pay for our sin. He's got to be a sacrifice. And so he doesn't, we don't see the image of a lion standing here. We see the image of a lamb. When you think of a lion, what do you think of? What do you think of? Power, ferocity, danger, <laughs> right? Uh, but let me back up. Can, is that photoshopped or what? You know what I'm saying? How in the world? I, I'm... I, what did you do? Wire his mouth shut? What are you, what are you doing? I, I, to me, that's Photoshop. I don't know. When you think of a lamb, what do you think about? Purity? 
innocence, weakness, helplessness. That's what Jesus looks like on the cross. He doesn't look strong. He looks like he's overwhelmed. I beheld in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, I'm in verse 6 again. In the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book, or the scroll, out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. So this Savior redeems as a slaughtered lamb. He's a lamb as it had been slain. Slaughter. In the throne room, notice his appearance. He's got, he looks like a slain lamb. He's got seven horns and seven eyes. These are representing the seven spirits of God. What is the one action that he does? What does he do? He takes the scroll. He takes the scroll. And that leads to worship in the throne room. But they're going to worship on a different note. Remember chapter 1? We're worshiping God because we exist. He's our creator. We exist because he chose to make us and everything around us. This is a little different worship scene. It's worship to the Lamb now. Notice, let's keep going. We're in verse, we're in verse um, where we leave off. Um, yeah, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So the first part of this worship scene is prayer, represented by the, by the, um, uh, the, the odors or the, or the fragrances that are going up. Prayer is a part of this worship. What do you notice next? Verse 9, and they sung a new song. So what are we noticing now? Part, singing. It's a part of this worship. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy. No one else was. Thou art worthy to take the book, the scroll, and to open the seals thereof. Why? Because thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every tongue and people, excuse me, kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. So the content of their worship, um, what are they going to worship the Lord over? It starts in the middle of verse 9. Uh, first of all, he's done what? What's he done? He's redeemed us. What does it mean to redeem us? He's bought us back. We sold ourselves under sin. We've rebelled against God. That's you, that's me. Every one of us have. And the Lamb has died in our place for our sins so that we could be saved. If He came back to just destroy everything, we'd all be wiped out. He's redeemed us by His blood. He's done something else. Did you see verse 10? And has made us unto our God kings and priests. You may have a kingdom of priests. And we shall reign on the earth. So he's exalted us after our salvation. Treated us like royalty. Made us into royalty. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. And the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Which is why the 24 elders may just be representatives of the church at large. That's what many scholars would believe. They may or may not be right, I don't know. But I want you to notice there's multitudes of people now. We're talking, he says 10,000 times 10,000 and then thousands of thousands. Um, if you've ever had a chance, as I have been blessed with, to be in a choir, a large choir, where you've got several hundred people. And to sing praises to God, I'm telling you, it's, it, it sends the chills up your spine. If you've been in a large crowd where they've singing to God in unison, um, I'm not saying with parts, etc., but, but the idea is they're singing together to the glory of God and singing with their hearts. It is moving. 
And so now we see these multitudes of people. By the way, the book of Revelation is full of worship scenes. What now is the content of their worship? Well, you've redeemed us by his blood, your blood. You've exalted us for salvation. And you are worthy of all we can do to exalt you. Notice what they're saying. Verse 12. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. By the way, that's hallelujah, of course. Uh, uh, deals, or uh, Messiah deals with some of these very worship scenes. So give him your power. That's one way you can worship God. Do you have strength? Has God given you strength and ability? Are you using it for him? Whatever it is. What's the next thing he says we ought to give him? He's worthy to receive power. What's the next one? Riches. We ought to worship God with how we give. What's the next thing he says? Wisdom. We ought to give him the best wisdom we've got. Our best minds. We ought to, we ought to be thinking and, and, and seeing how we can use our wisdom for his glory. What's the next thing? Strength. Uh, what's the next one? Honor. We ought to give him honor. How about the next one? Glory. What's the next one? Blessing. These are things that we ought to be giving to God as part of our worship to Him because He's worthy. Can't imagine. There's another list in verse 13. It's not as long, but it's, 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 it's tremendously powerful. Every creature, notice this is every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth. By the way, does that ring like Philippians chapter 2 to you? Wherefore, God has highly exalted in verse 9, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I believe that's echoed it right here in this verse. Every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea. And all that are in them heard I saying, here we go, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb forever and ever. So there's your list. Blessing, honor, glory, power forever and ever belong to our God. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twelve and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So let's summarize here. God has every right to take this world back because in chapter 4 we're learning what? He created it. What about chapter 5? He redeemed it, exactly. The blood of Christ has bought it back. And we're going to need to know that when we get to chapter 6 and following. Because when that scroll starts opening, there are going to be judgments and sorrow and woe. Just like Ezekiel had said. So again, summarizing, God has every right to judge you, by the way. Why? Because he created you. And because he provided for your redemption too. So we have to say that God has claims not just on the world, but on you and I as individuals. And that is why it is such a wicked thing for me to live my life for myself. When God has created me and he has redeemed me, Jesus has died on the cross so I could be redeemed. And for me to turn my back and say, God, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to live it for me. I'm going to take my existence that I, you, you, yeah, you gave it to me, but I'm going to live it for myself. I'm going to get angry with you and I'm going to use excuses. I'm going to walk off and do my own thing. I don't care what you think. That is exactly the world God's going to judge. And let me say this. The world God's going to judge is made up of individuals just like you and I right here today. We're the same people. So if we expect 
that God is going to judge the world at large, let's not think that he won't judge me. But let's be on the side of the worshipers. Let's be on the side of people that give glory and honor and our strength to the King of kings and Lord of lords who not only created me, but who came to redeem me and bought me back to him with his blood. Have you, have you come to Christ? Have you accepted him? If you haven't, you are living in rebellion and you are in grave danger of his judgment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we exist because you decided to do it. We are privileged. Every breath comes from you. Daniel tells us that. Our bodies are held together. This whole universe is held together by your word. Forgive us. Forgive us for not worshiping you as our creator. Forgive us for not worshiping you for what you've done for us as our redeemer. For the lamb who has been slain for, so that we could be bought back to you. Oh Lord, forgive us for hanging on to our lives and thinking we have every right to live for ourselves. For this is the world that you're going to judge. Lord, I pray for any who, if Christ were to return today, would be part of what's coming. Deliver them, we pray. And for those of us that know thee, O oh Lord, make us into people that will worship in spirit and in truth with our whole heart. We pray this for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. With their heads bowed for just a moment. Let there be some this morning in, as a Christian you're saying, I, I know the Lord, but boy, I've been, I, can, I can list some areas of my life where I just have not surrendered to God. And I've seen that I exist because of God's goodness. And, and Jesus has bought me with his blood. And I've just been wrong. I'm holding God at arm's length. Whatever issue it is, I pray that God will speak to your heart and that you will say, Lord, forgive me. Make that issue right with him and go on with him. Whether it's something that you need to stop doing or something you need to start doing, but that you would surrender to your creator and your redeemer. And be a worshiper of God. Some of you Christians, and I, I, I would be in this category myself, would say, oh, Lord, I want to worship you better. I want to be a person of praise and honor to you for who you are, not just for all the things you give me. But there may be some here this morning who say, Pastor, to be honest, I... If God's going to judge the world one day, which he will, the lion of the tribe of Judah is going to judge. He's going to prevail. That's happening. It's going to happen. If that world is made of individuals like me, I'm not ready. And I want to get ready to meet the king. And if you were like that, if you just slip a hand up so I can see it, I don't want to miss you. I'm scanning the crowd, I'm not seeing anybody. But if, that's, if that is your heart, please talk to me. There's nothing more important than being a true follower of, of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, bless these folks. We thank you so much for them. They've listened well. They've followed and tracked through this passage, Lord. It's been a lengthy one. But I pray you give them understanding and that we would grab onto those two truths. It's not just for, for the world at large. It's for me as an individual. You created me. Christ came to redeem me. I have responsibilities because of those two truths. May we grab onto, not run from, but grab onto those two responsibilities, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Lord bless you, you are dismissed.